You should close your blinds, Benno. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you live in the Netherlands. It was raining the whole day. and uh, <laughs> Terrible moment, rain, terrible wind, and terrible sun. I'm well aware. Yeah, now, now we have sun. At the moment, I don't need it. I don't want it. <sighs> yeah, thank you. <sighs> Welcome. This is the DNSOP working group, session one. You're all welcome. Um, I think we can just start with this, with the chair slide. So Tim will do the introduction, give uh, the note well um, agenda and the status of the of the documents. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Note note well. Also, uh, this session is being recorded. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, oh no. Thank you, Benno. Good morning, all. Yep. Yeah. Um, so why don't we move on with the chair slides? We'll make it quick. Yeah. I'm still there. Um, there we are. There we are. Let's get to the note. Well, you know me, I'm Tim, that's Benno and Suzanne's, Suzanne's there being quiet for the moment. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen this by now. And please be aware that everybody's being recorded, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if we move on. We've got two meetings back to back, so I think I put the whole agenda down in here um, later on. If we move on, then it's like this morning, the first session, we'll we'll do a quick update. Um, we've got some current work that we're going to talk about, and some hackathon updates from Willem. And then the second session is mostly new talks, um, new discussions, things of that nature. So, the next slide, sir. Um, quick note, um, coming up tomorrow, there's a BOF called Danish. It's on Dane authentication for IoT service hardening. Um, I, they probably spent a lot of time working on that name. It's interesting because it's, you know, it's more Dane stuff. It's, it's um, Schumann and Victor's um, plan on taking over the world. Um, so they've got two things they're going to talk about is his client cert, the client cert work they're working on. And there's some interesting stuff going on there. So. If you're interested, um, I, I think you all should sort of make a note to pay attention. I think Michael's going to, one of the things he's going to mention at the end of the second session has something to do with this as well. Um, and he's one of the chairs as well as Mr. Hardiker. Um, so if either of them want to sort of speak up and say something, they're more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, we think it's interesting. Oh, Wes wants to speak. Yeah, so I mean, really, it, it is interesting, and everybody should come. And uh, That's right. we're trying to figure out new ways to to do Dane Internet of Thing, Dane with Internet of Things, talking to other Internet of Things and other service providers, and do key lookups and stuff in it's an easier exactly. way. Thanks. So, so uh, yeah, Michael has uploaded some slides. So at the very end of the session, after his own <laughs> presentation, he will have a three minutes pitch uh, for the, uh, the Danish Bof. <laughs> Yep. Thanks. Yeah. So, so, all right. Next slide, sir. We'll do some quick updates on some documents. And we've had one since the last one. We finally got Zone Digest published. It's 8976. So thank you, um, Dwayne and others, for all the work on that one. Um, so currently, server cookies is in the editor queue. Um, the Yang document needs the Shepherd write up. And 7816 biz, it's an interesting thing, Ralph has a new job and he sort of dropped off the face of the earth for a little bit and he seems to hold the pen. And so we're trying to actually track down what to do there. Um, we're not letting it slide. We're just sort of in in flux there. And I have to finish up the NSEC TTL working group last call and sort of get that sorted up, Peter. My my bad on that. So we'll get I'll get that sorted out here in the next few days. Thanks. So the Currently on service B, that seems to be, um, as I sort of stated earlier this week, service B is a new text record for the 21st century. Um, they're, they're, we've been, they've been sort of doing lots of work and there's a couple of things they've done recently. They've sort of, they want to change the parameter registry to first come first serve. Ben had a good talk with Diana about that. Um, we've been awaiting, we've been sort of watching because the, the ECH work going on in TLS is kind of, they're going to be tracking each one, um, each document, so they'll probably end up getting bashed up as they go through the editor queue. Um, there's been a small change on changing echo to fig to ECH. 
and so there's some discussion on code points and testing that we're going to sort of settle out but we do think we're ready for working group last call um but if anybody wants to speak up and say we're you know we're wrong then please you know you're welcome to sort of speak that up sort of thing so looks like Benno's playing with the slides so I'm going to bounce up two more after service B there's um I did a short write-up from the authors about delegation only there we go um there's been some work they've addressed these issues the zone cut label the empty non-terminal issue resolved in the latest draft there's a glue workaround described and if there's a better solution they really want to hear from folks um we do feel all the protocol technical issues have been raised if there's others we know this is a controversial one and i'm sure people are sort of going to push back on some of this so we're i'm waiting to see what's get sort of said along the way here and you know is this ready to move forward are we going to move forward with it? Are people just going to be like no this is just you know so we i know this is sort of this is one of the more controversial ones so but i think a lot of stuff's been addressed so we welcome to hear from folks so jump to the next one um we do we've got a couple of things that are really working for working group last call tcp requirements it's been sitting there and um it it's more been sort of a timing thing with folk with some of the chairs um i do think dns revalidation that's been um recently updated i think it's very close if not it's ready already um the 5933 biz is really working, sort of waiting on this sort of IANA consideration discussion um, and that that Paul's going to have later. Because I think Paul did show up. He said he may not. So I appreciate, glad to see that he's made it. And 8499 biz, there hasn't been much discussion. And I'd like to sort of figure that out. And I'm going to have to spend a little bit of time trying to work forward on that. We'd like to sort of see that sort of, you know, are we really going to do this or not? So it's not a big bunch of changes, but I think we should just sort of do it and get it done and move it on. So next one, Mr. Benno. A couple of these documents have expired and we've been trying to track the authors down. Um, I, I think um, Daniel's gonna update validated requirements. We do, you know, we I think the working group needs to figure out, are we gonna move forward with these? Are there worth discussions? you know are we just gonna let them expire um we should just not let them expire quietly we should really sort of make a decision you know even if no decision is the right decision we should at least state that so that's kind of my feeling on that one so thanks let's go on to the next one there's not too many left oh yeah we i have nothing to say on this right now um i usually don't i try to be quiet about this um <laughs> thanks panel and this one we were gonna basically try to put out a call for adoption for a few months ago and i think it got lost in the shuffle after the last meeting around the holidays all right so i think this will be revisited and probably moved out um we'll probably do that so uh next one i think that's really our main things we're working on up oh, roy would like to speak please go ahead roy hi thanks um really quick on um private use top level domains um, I understand that the um, IAB has um, 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 used this liaison process to um, to ask a question to the um, ISO um, working group on um, 3166 um, country codes. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to gather, gather my thoughts here. So that's the, that's the status of this document. I think we're waiting for that that, that, that response. See what's see what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Roy. That yes, I, that. I wasn't going to say no, I was not going to say anything because I figure I didn't quite, I wasn't going to quite say it correctly, but yes, we're going through the whole, um, let's use the process right now. Um, so, so thank you. Um, our stuff is all in the data tracker. It's all also in Git. Um, so folks are welcome to sort of check in and sort of tell us what's going on. Um, and I think that's it on the first agenda. Willem's going to talk about the sort of hackathon stuff they've worked on. He's then going to talk about catalog zones. And Paul um, yep, <laughs> is going to chat. That's kind of our first hour. And then um, session two, we'll 
we'll have some more sort of Mr. Fujiwara's son's going to talk about avoid fragmentation as we decide where to go with that, and then a bunch of new business, um, NSEC 3 guidance, DNSSEC automation, et cetera. So that's the essential of what's going on. So it's, it's going to be three hours sort of back to back. So we hope everybody sort of has, you know, nice and relaxed and ready to sort of get going. So that's all I have to say. And I'll stop talking and let people sort of get down to business. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So uh, one correction is um, so, uh, my fault is that the presenters of uh, Catalog Zones will be uh, Libor and uh, Peter, Peter van Dijk. Uh, but that will is properly uh, in the agenda. It's my fault. No problem. OK. Um, OK, Willem, are you ready? I will share your I'm slides. Oh, I cannot share them myself. Of course, you can. Uh, yeah. I can. I will prefer that. Uh, let's. Uh, but, okay, there yeah. we are. Yeah, I. Uh, oh, you have. You have screen. Your screen is granted by uh, the magic powers. So, okay. I will stop. And then you can. Now you see. No, now you are able to share the your screen. Um, well, maybe it was the other way around. Oh, yeah. Do you really uh, want okay. to share your screen? Yes, I really yeah. want to do that. And then application, this one. Excellent. Yes. So, yes, we there was a. Uh, DNS hackathon the week before this uh, ITF week uh, on uh, working days from the Mar 1st of March till the 5th of March. Uh, and But that turned out to be a, a ZOT hackathon, but uh, you will learn more about it in this presentation. So uh, in the beginning of February, or last in the previous uh, hackathon, at the ITF uh, 109, I, uh, we used uh, the DNS orgs MetaMost to uh, talk between the uh, participants of the hackathon. And uh, which is, uh, by the way, open for everybody. I have a link on the uh, hackathon wiki page where you can subscribe to this uh, chat service. So, uh, but all the DNS developers are uh, already there. So it's sort of convenient place to uh, uh, talk amongst uh, each other. And uh, I renamed uh, the channel name from Hackathon 109 to Hackathon 110. And then some people began sort of complaining, ah, it's a pity that we cannot have an in-person Hackathon. And because like Hob Hobby said it, or Peter van Dijk, you know, a Hackathon week will see me doing three small 15 minutes things over that week, but the hackathon weekend, uh, in-person hackathon, you either do a lot of stuff or absolutely nothing because you're only chatting. So I uh, proposed to organize a uh, hackathon, in-person hackathon day, week Saturday at uh, the Enoma Labs uh, office. There are quite a few uh, Dutch DNS developers and I invited them all over, but none of them dared except for Matthijs. No, <laughs> I said, we will keep distance and I'll, I'll do the windows open and everything. But uh, yeah, so Matthijs came Saturday, the 6th of March, which was uh, really nice. So here's Matthijs uh, entering uh, on the 6th of March. March. So uh, before the hackathon started, there were quite some ideas from DNS developers that they wanted to work on, like uh, DNS over quick, and we wanted to work on the new catalog zone stuff, which uh, will be talked about uh, later. But yeah, DNS, like, uh, like I showed you before, DNS developers really have to work du during the week and they, they have little spare time. So most of that didn't happen, uh, though, we, there was also a plan, plan to work on Zot, and that's not the uh, sentient species that's on Wikipedia, 
the Wikipedia in the Star Wars universe, but zone transfers over TLS. And uh, yeah, a part of uh, zone transfers are also the extended DNS errors. So we worked on that too. Uh, and Sarah Dickinson, uh, she uh, put together this excellent uh, hackathon planning uh, document on uh, Google Docs. And unfortunately, uh, Sarah herself, she didn't feel so well in the, at the beginning of the hackathon week. So she ha hasn't actually participated uh, during the week. Uh, but there was uh, the people listed on the slide, Shifan, Pallavi, and Han. They had a small group working from the United States. And uh, we had a new uh, developer at NLNet Labs, Tom Carpe, who worked on the extended DNS errors. Wouter, he reviewed all Shifan Palavis and Hans uh, uh, commits. And uh, Peter van Dijk and Matthijs Mekking worked on uh, ZOT for PowerDNS and for BIND. Oh, because we also wanted to do interoperability testing. And for this, I uh, registered the domain name ZOTROCKS and spin up a few virtual machines to do interoperability testing and play with name servers and uh, ZOT, basically. So what got done? Well, Tom Coppé, uh, he uh, worked on extended DNS errors in uh, NSD. And he found, for example, when uh, going over all the uh, error, DNS error or uh, error codes in NSD, that some could use a uh, extra um, code point for uh, as a uh, extended DNS error. For example, uh, when a DNAME expansion becomes too large, right? So uh, there is this. It's uh, returns for R code Y X domain, which means some name that ought not to exist does exist. That, that doesn't say that much. Though this combination of D name and Y X domain might tell you that its uh, expansion became too large. But we also noticed that uh, other name servers uh, uh, return serve fail. So maybe a EDE code for this would be nice. So we did now with other. Uh, Pallavi and Han worked on access controls to provide zones for ZOT only. Of course, if you uh, provide zones over TLS, you do not want them to leak over other uh, transports. Uh, so this is what the uh, access control uh, list entry looks like in NSD. And also, if you make an access control to provide zones Oh, for the whole internet without a TSEC key as configured uh, uh, in the above pane, then NSD will uh, warn you or error actually that this is not allowed because if you're offering over TLS, you do not want other ones to see your sound content. And if you're offering it to everybody without authentication, then that's probably not what you meant to do. So I tricked for testing purposes uh, NSD into serving a zone to everyone, the ZOT work zone, by splitting <laughs> the, the whole internet in two and uh, providing four uh, access control list entries and, uh, for IPv4 and IPv6 space. So in the below pane, you see that it works. Uh, with KDIC, you can uh, do queries over TLS and also uh, a transport over TLS already. So I also worked for uh, access control for queries. We, uh, this is obvious in many name servers, but NSD didn't have it yet. But it's also part of the ZOT draft that you may not want to uh, allow queries on uh, zones which are offered over ZOT. So uh, I we use the same access control mechanism, and uh, but I'm I'm sharing this uh, this broke the name server. I'm showing you why because you know to do a zone transfer 
the secondary needs to do a SOAR query first. So uh, with this uh, access control, I prevented SOAR queries. And um, I'm showing this because I think it's um, interesting. Well, maybe uh, show you on the next slide why. Because maybe you also do not want to leak what zones you are ser serving if you're offering it over ZOT uh, by query. So maybe you want to prevent uh, SOA queries so that uh, the name server cannot discover which zones are served. So this is explicitly not part of the ZOT draft because there are many uh, uh, paths which will leak which zones are uh, served, like uh, Notify, for example, or the SOAR query preceding a transfer. But on the catalog zones, we have an option, the uh, talk will follow after this one, in which the serial numbers can be distributed to the secondaries uh, via the catalog zones, potentially over TLS. So in that case, you do not need to Notify anymore, and also in the catalog zone uh, draft, it says that you do not have to do a SOA query first, but can immediately transfer the zone and you know, abort if it is not what you expect it to be. So I think that would be an interesting thing to explore in the future, maybe. Uh, also, interoperability testing between PowerDNS bind and NSD. This all went very well. Here you have me and Matthijs on the hackathon Saturday at the NL Net Labs office, uh, creating the, the, the secondary primary relationships between the different pieces of software. And uh, what did we le learn? You know, uh, maybe it would be nice to uh, start thinking about updating uh, extended DNS errors with all the new stuff that we don't have nice codes in uh, EDE if people are implementing that. Uh, privacy, uh, th this is an interesting thing to explore where you're not revealing what zones you serve by uh, queries either by combining sort with catalog zones or ser serial distribution via catalog zones and extended DNS errors. And uh, yeah, the conclusion is more or less that SOT just wor uh, works. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. These were all the people that uh, participated in the hackathon. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. Yeah, well, it's good to yeah. see that the hackathon is not, is, is not being forgotten, even under our current circumstances. And it would be nice to have people in the same room again someday. That, that would be nice. Indeed. Thank you. Um, up next, unless there are very urgent questions here. Let's check in the... Uh, Okay, no, not in the not in the chat room either. Um, yeah, then I like to invite uh, Libero Pellan and um, Peter van Dijk for the next presentation. Shall I run the, the slides? Libor, yes, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I'll share my screen. Uh, let's see. Oh. This one. Yeah, there they are. And full screen. Okay, so hello. There we Paul. are. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me well? Yeah, excellent. Thank and you. There is there is quite much going on around catalog zones. And there are things to be discussed, so I'm looking forward for the discussion section of this presentation. Uh, we prepared just a new version of the draft just before the IETF meeting deadline, so sorry for that. But yeah, let me start with the, with a the recap what catalog zones are and their history. Next slide, please. So what catalog zones are, there are a way of configuring an authoritative DNS server remotely. 
So this mostly applies when you have a primary secondary environment and your set of zones is changing frequently. So you like need it for synchronizing the set of zones that are configured on the secondary with the primary. And it's done with the use of fake crafted zone. And this is uh, in order for implementation simplicity because there are already well-established AXFR, AXFR techniques for transferring a zone and also for the sake of interoperability. Next slide, please. So it all started several years ago with an implementation in BIND and later a respective draft that described the catalog zone with quite many configuration options embedded in it. But this was not entirely successful. Next slide. So last year we came with a different approach that is quite minimalistic. And it means that uh, in the catalog zone, there is just a list of the member zone, just a list and nothing more. And no configuration op options in there. And we presented this in the last ITF meeting with the message that we are almost done, that we need only to solve some nitpicks and we are waiting for further implementations. The first one being NodeDNS 3.0. Next slide. So this is how the new approach looked like. It was just a zone with the list of member zones to be configured. And their configuration was all taken from a configuration template that was assigned to the catalog. So this worked that well that for the operator that uh, needs several groups of member zones with different configuration in each group, he was expected and we actually encouraged him to operate several catalog zones where each catalog zone uh, contained the uh, members with the same configuration, for example, DNS signed and in the second group unsigned in the third group, for example, NSEC3 and so on. So this works pretty well and we were happy with that. And also the users which already emerged were happy with it. But uh, a problem appeared and this problem was that uh, once the operator needs to transfer the member zone from one catalog to another, he just needs to like remove it from the one catalog zone and add it to another one. Next slide, please. But uh, this process can be like synchronized. When you modify two different zones, there is no guarantee that the XFR to the secondaries will get synchronized, will get, will get just at once. So this was quite difficult, but Willem found a solution that was quite viable. It was a solution to transfer the member zone between two catalogs safely. It was quite difficult to be implemented, but uh, I managed to make a working prototype. And for the operator, it was quite easy to operate, but not entirely. And it took two steps because it can't be done at once. So it was uh, kind of rollover. And we were expecting to, to use this and to finally solve all the problems of catalog zones. But please, next slide. Another requirement emerged that somehow the catalog zones you are removing the member from shall have control over which other catalog zone is the member transferred to. Uh, please wait for uh, the second half of the presentation for Peter who explains the details about this. But uh, overall, next slide, please. So overall, we, we like found that this is no longer viable and we resigned on the property of catalog zone that the catalog zone is just a list of members. And we defined uh, properties of each member within the catalog zone that the member can optionally have. So there are so far three properties. I hope they will remain very little of them and because uh, in order to maintain the simplicity of catalog zones. Uh, please, next slide. 
so in the end, it will look like this. Uh, we have a PTR record defining uh, member zone within a catalog and uh, several additional records uh, respective to the member, which define in which configuration group it is and some other some other properties of the member. Next slide, please. So let me start with the configuration group. It's a solution for the operators that need several configuration group, like groups of differently configured members. They are no longer encouraged to operate uh, several catalog zones, although they still can, but they are encouraged to define several configuration groups within one catalog zone. And this way they, they can very easily switch a member zone between two configuration groups because it all happens within one catalog zone and the resulting change of the catalog zone will be easily transferred at once to all the secondaries. Yeah, so next slide and uh, Peter, please continue. Yes, thank you. So as Libor mentioned, we have three zone properties defined right now, besides the member zone name, of course. Uh, and as Willem also mentioned in the XOT talk just now, there is a desire for several reasons to signal serial changes more efficiently uh, by putting the serial property in the catalog zone, which is an optional thing to do. And I imagine not all implementations might do it, not all operators might want it. Um, however, this allows operators that do want this to avoid a lot of SOA queries, to avoid having to worry about missed notifies because of packet loss or secondaries being down for a while because of network changes or whatever. This also allows a primary to decide when to do a big push because he might have capacity to serve all those zone transfers. Uh, in this example, the serial is encoded in a C-Sync resource record, but this is open to discussion right now. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As Libor mentioned, uh, the previous implement their implementation, CZ Think implementation, use multiple catalog zones to map to multiple configuration templates, which is not something that might be appropriate for all setups. Uh, beyond that, we found that some operators might be running catalog zones from multiple users, multiple operators, which means that if you remove a zone from one catalog, you do not want that zone to pop up randomly in some other ca user's catalog that had list, has listed that zone that would basically be hijacking as a service. So instead of that, uh, a power DNS contributor called Case Monshauer proposed a change of ownership property where the catalog zone that is about to remove a member zone can tell the secondary, I want this member zone to go to this specific other catalog. Then when the other catalog has accepted the member zone, the change of ownership property can be removed from the first zone and everything happens in a predictable way. Next slide, please. This brings us to our last slide with a few open questions. Uh, some people have requested that the unique ID for a zone be predictable so that it is possible to do queries into catalog zones so that given a member zone name, you can find the properties without listing the whole zone. The use cases for that have not been described in our draft yet. The second question is, as I mentioned, that the signaling of serial numbers right now uses C-Sync in the example, uh, which seems quite appropriate because it has the serial number and a couple of flag fields that we might put to good use. Other people have suggested we should just use TXT, which might be okay because it does live at a separate, separate uh, uh, name, uh, label under the unique ID. And also these zones are not for querying if we ignore the first question here. <clears throat> uh, a ver previous version of the draft also suggested defining a new serial type holding just 32 bits uh, of a number. 
And finally, we would really like to hear from operators whether the draft in the current form, even though it's a bit messy, seems viable and covers their primary needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Libor and uh, Peter. Um, yeah, the, the floor is open. Uh, uh, Alexander, please. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, Peter Libor, thanks, thanks for uh, creating that new version. And uh, I, I talked to our operators team before, and, and they said it's absolutely a requirement that they can see the, the serial number of the zone, the catalog zone, because otherwise, as you, as you very well know, um, we need to bombard the primary name servers with, with SOA queries all the time, and that's very frustrating. So one of the main use cases for us would be to have essentially a catalog of uh, serial numbers. So that's much appreciated. No, no matter what form it takes, uh, uh, we don't really mind if it's messy or not. I mean, from the operational perspective, of course. But as long as the serial number is there, it's good. Right, yeah, the, the plan is for the draft, of course, to be not messy in the end, in the implementation as well. And you do make a good point. Some people do not need catalog zones to tell their secondaries what domains they have, but some people do have a serial signaling problem. And I feel that the intention is that we can solve that too. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ray, Ray Billis, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm concerned about the serial signaling, actually. Um, I think there's far too little discussion, either on the list or in the draft, about how these serial numbers would be kept up to date, because it kind of either implies that the catalog zone itself on the primary server has to either be synthetic and generate those values on the fly based on the other zones that are present, or to have some other out-of-band process automatically update the catalog zone using DNS update. Um, I mean, I mean, if the feature is optional, that's one thing. But if it's going to be kind of mandatory, then um, yeah, that has massive effects for how people actually use catalog zones in production, but actually maintain that zone. So I know the PowerDNS implementation is in fact completely synthetic, in which case this is very easy for us. But it might would make total sense for other people to generate these zones via NS update or just as text files. And for them, it would indeed be harder to keep the serials updated depending on their total scale, number of zones, etc. So I do feel we need to keep this property optional so that implementations can decide if it's easy for them or easy or hard for them, depending on the mode of operation. And of course, operators can then make their choices in how they operate their service, what software they choose. Yeah, but it I definitely mean, we are mandatory, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean that, that's good. I mean we are actually using catalog zones in production um, at ISC for um, our uh, lots of our other domain names, uh, not our core domain name. And um, yeah, it would it would require a change in process if the serial stuff became mandatory. Then I don't think we should do that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Peter. Any other issues, questions, points you want to share or to bring up to the microphone? So, <clears throat> um, what, what, so, um, to the author, so you did talk, oh, sorry, Lieber, please go ahead before I start summarizing. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite disappointed that this didn't lead to, to a bigger discussion because uh, this uh, like new proposal is, is quite, quite new. It's baked just before this ITF deadline and we were expecting uh, much more like uh, discussion around uh, either a pro approval of this new approach or or denial or something like that yeah besides this uh my my personal like if my personal feel fear around the serial property is that uh the catalog zone will be updated very frequently and in the operators which i guess is the usual usual use case for catalog zones which have 
very many member zones, it might lead to like uh, the huge catalog zone is updated frequently. And these are the properties that do not really work together if you have a big zone and you you update it frequently. But this is this is just my perspective. I'm not an operator, I'm just the software author. So yeah. I would be I would be willing to hear more about this. Thank you. Uh, Alexander, please go ahead. You're muted. Uh, yeah. I like that last remark. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Peter Thank you. here. The bit between the mostly static and mostly dynamic parts has come up in discussion, but I don't think the draft currently mentions it. I do think it would not be a big change to any part of the protocol. Uh, I guess it would actually come down to implementation decisions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ray, please go ahead. And I close the queue, um, Peter. Peter. Yes. So on, on this question of the serial signaling, whether that be TXT or C-Sync or something else, um, I'd like to reiterate what I said on the list a few weeks ago, that I don't think it should be C-Sync. Um, as a previous pen holder on previous versions of this draft, I did go to some lengths to avoid semantic abuse of existing RR types. Um, you know, C-Sync is defined for being child, sorry, parent to child signaling or vice versa, I can't remember, sorry, child to parent signaling. This is not child to parent, it's primary to secondary. And yes, it happens to have the right fields, but it's a semantic abuse. Um, that said, a new type is not necessarily the right answer because then we've got to define an RR type, which is only essentially different interviews within catalog zones, um, which is not a problem in terms of the allocations and all, the number of RR types that are available, but it might have implications. Yeah, should it be recorded as a meta type, for example, or indeed there are new type of types. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is, but I don't think the C sync is it. Thank you, uh, Peter. Go, please go ahead. Or is there a reply by one of the authors? Hi, the next speaker in the queue is the Peter that proposed C sync. So I'll just let him talk. Okay, excellent. Peter, please go ahead. Yeah, although, um, yeah, so the comments I wanted to make are not specifically on how to serial, um, on how to signal the serials. I um, proposed the C-Sync thing because it contains the field for serials, and I don't think it would be such a semantic abuse, but I don't have any stakes in that. Um, so um, I raised my hand here um, to comment on something else, which was the catalog zone size and the frequent changes if you include properties like um, serial. And um, yeah, it's true that um, the, the catalog zones can become pretty large, but I think there may be other ways um, around that um, that are different from just avoiding the large size. For example, you could um, do an IXFR instead of an AXFR, which of course not all server software supports, but um, so that might be something to be considered because if you do an IXFR between two catalog zone versions, then the diff you get essentially tells you the recipe what to change in the secondary, which zones to add, to remove, and for which ones the serial has changed. So that's pretty much a minimal set of what you would want to know in such a case. And also, um, so, so that is from the conceptual side, not from the implementation side. Of course, implementation for that is also significant work and all. Um, and second, um, one could do sharding. 
um, like uh, for IP reverse zones, which are usually not all in one zone, but there are sub zones depending on the prefix. One could do a similar thing um, for um, catalog zones. So for example, if the unique ID that's listed here at the top bullet would be um, some sort of hash of um, the member zone name, then you could, for example, um, split up the catalog zone in 16 sub catalog zones, for example, by the last or first digit of that hash. I'm not saying that should be done, but I'm, I'm saying that um, if you do such sharding, then the size sort of reduces exponentially and the, the update frequency also may reduce significantly. Um, or you might find some other sort of grouping uh, for frequently and non-frequently changing stuff, for example. So I think there are solutions around that. Um, yeah, and somebody has said that um, catalog zones will not be publicly queried. Um, that may be not the current intention, but I can foresee use cases where that may be useful. Um, so what we've discussed on the um, DNS catalog mattermost zone, um, sorry, not zone channel, um, was an idea that I had if you have a new domain and you communicate the NS record set to the registry, for example, to .de, then um, one question in DNSSEC setups is how you get the DS record set provisioned for the first time. And um, one approach could be to take the host names in the NS record set, for example, ns whatever name server, and use that as a catalog zone, have subdomains of the name server host name itself, where the registry can query properties of that name server's member zones and get the CDS records from there to provision DS for the first time. And that, of course, works only if the name server zone itself is signed, and there's other issues for that. I'm not proposing to do this now. There's, of course, um, a large amount of questions that is unclear. But to me, it's not clear that catalog zones will not be queried by some external actor in the future. So we should have something that is clean conceptually. <coughs> OK, thank you. Um, I close this session of this uh, this agenda item um thank you all uh, there has there is an uh, a metamost instance channel uh to discuss the more implementation details so of course the protocol discussion needs to be take needs to take place on the the mailing list the dns op mailing list but uh, ask the authors if you're interested to be be to be involved a little bit more into the details and the implementation, ask them how to get on the MetaMouse OARC uh, channel for the catalog zones. It's open for everyone. Um, okay. Any other? Maybe, uh, well, let's go forward to the next session, to the next item. Um, right. Paul, yeah, excellent. I will run the slides for you, Paul. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, wait a minute. One moment. There we are. Uh, I'm not seeing them if you are I'm, uh, <clears throat> it's here yeah okay so there we are great thank you okay so um greetings and as someone said we need we need a new term that is not good morning good evening good afternoon yeah. um so it's good morning for me um so this draft, uh, basically, you know, we discussed it at the last meeting. We're here now, um, and uh, I'd like to give just a very brief overview. And then, if there's more discussion, I think it's best on the list. Um, we did a lot of Mike line the last time um, that didn't go to the list. I would rather see stuff on the list. Um, next slide. Um, so. This, you know, after the last meeting, I, I had done this as a personal document. It was adopted as a working group document um, after the last meeting, which was in November, which I guess everything is still in March of 2020. Um, I published the 00 in January. 
it's really short. If you remove the normal front and back stuff, it's like a page and a half of text. So um, if you're wanting to read a short draft, this is this is your draft. <laughs> Um, but there was no discussion on the list. Um, Modulo, something that um, just got posted this morning, uh, which is cool. But um, it, I, you know, clearly, if people have you know concerns, it, it sh they should be on the list. So thank you for to Vladimir for posting it an hour ago. But um, really, we've had no discussion. So maybe it's ready for working group last call, and that will bring out discussion. Um, I don't know. Next slide. So there are two motivations here. One is uh, the Goss BIS draft, um, which again needs to be on standards track, which means we have to prove it as a standard, even though basically none of us understand it. Um, and uh, and I'm not picking on Goss at all. It's a national standard, um, but other working groups, uh, other protocols uh, don't require standards track. They require RFC published. Um, and so, for example, just literally just yesterday, uh, for TLS, a new um, Chinese national standard uh, whose name I'm actually forgetting, but it's in RFC 8998, um, was published, um, informational, went through the independent submissions editor, had plenty of comments from TLS active people, um, because the independent submission editor always does that anyways. Um, so one of the motivations is for us to start being like other ones, you know, for national standards. Um, the other the other motivation is, quite frankly, we're facing, you know, with with um, new post quantum uh, algorithms coming, we're facing a deluge of signature algorithms. Um, there are already a bunch of proposals, and uh, in the last few weeks, NIST proposed that it might in fact not pick one but it might say let's try a whole bunch of these for a while and then we'll pick one which would mean if and, and since we're not going to know ahead of time which ones we want um, it would mean putting a zillion of these on standards track which is much more heavy weight than just saying rfc required so these are the two motivations uh, next slide um so before before this draft was was even started, we had RFC 6014, which DNSX did in 2010, um, which made all of the, the DNSX registries RFC required, except they forgot DNS, uh, DS and NSEC records. Um, and there was no justification for forgetting DS and NSEC. They probably just forgot them. Um, but we also, in this working group, just recently did RFC 8. 8624, which is algorithm implementation requirements and usage guidelines. So not what is and is not allowed, but what the usage guidelines for these algorithms are. Um, and in that document, it talks about GOST as a may, but it doesn't say anything about any other national alg algorithms, uh, simply because we don't have those yet. Um, so what I intended to do, and I think I did okay, was to combine the best of uh, RFC 6014 and 8624 with the idea that what we want to do is, is to have all of our algorithms, including DS and NSEC and NSEC3, be, uh, have the same requirements and to make sure that 8624, which a lot of people are following, um, to be correct. Next slide. Also, I, I also had the motivation of trying to keep it under two pages. I think I did that. Um, so what this draft does is that it updates um, uh, 6014 um, to make it RFC required. It updates 8624 to automate, automatically make these non-standard track algorithms may implement. Um, I, of these two, I think the 8624 is the most important. Um, that is that people who are follow, you know, implementers who are saying, well, what do I do with all of these? That they will have a specific statement saying, it's just a may, you can do what you want, others, others can do what they want. Um, if there is a point later where a national standard 
is widely adopted or that the working group wants it to be widely adopted, then you can upgrade in, you, you can update 8624 to say, and, and I think we are going to update 8624 in the future anyways, to say this one now has gone from may to should or whatever. Um, my third bullet where I say that's all is actually incorrect, as Vladimir uh, pointed out in the one comment that came in about this an hour and a half ago, um, which is that I also, um, in, in the IANA considerations, I also make the NSEC 3 and NSEC 3 parameters flags also be RFC required. And Vladimir asked, isn't that dangerous? We've only got a few of them. There's like seven left or whatever. Um, but no, it's not dangerous in that if all of a sudden they start filling up, we change that. Um, it, basically, I'm trying to bring into, you know, the DNS world into alignment with the algorithm choices made by everyone else. And they have these limited flags also with small amounts. The assumption is we're going to be following what's going on. And none of this is going to happen behind our back. So for example, let's say someone comes out and has a new NSEC 3 parameter that they want a new flag for. DNS op is going to be alerted of it. Certainly the ISG is going to be alerted of it. Um, even if they go through the independent stream editor, there's going to be reviews. And some of the reviews might say, hey, don't do this or whatever. And, and so we're not going to get blindsided by, by all of a sudden running out of flags or anything like that. Or we're not going to get blindsided by someone saying, I didn't even know that there was such a new national algorithm. There will be stuff sent to the list. It's really a question of, does the working group have to make a standard for each one? Uh, next slide, and I think that's it. Or maybe that's it. <laughs> I guess that was the last slide. Yeah, that, that was it, yeah. Very Thank good. you. Okay, so that's all um, modulo, the one thing that, that uh, Vladimir brought on the list. So I'm open for questions, but again, my preference would be that we actually discuss this on the mailing list, so. Good, yeah. Uh, Jim, please go ahead. Jim, we can't hear your accent. <laughs> Okay, I will try speaking in the Queen's English. I think this is a lovely little draft and long overdue, Paul. I think we should just go straight to last call. I don't think we need to have further discussion about this to any great extent. There might be some meta issues around things like the choice of algorithms having may or recommended or shoulds associated with them. But I don't think that affects this draft in any way. I think that stuff probably needs to go into a separate document that explains to people that are doing DNSX stuff with new crypto what the, their choices of crypto algorithms might mean from the point of view of interoperability or security because of the fact they may or may not be validated as they're not necessarily recommended algorithms. That I think is an entirely separate issue and not something for this document. I think we're just going ahead and get this thing out the door as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, Dimitri. Hi. As uh, the author of the Ghost uh, 5933 piece draft, uh, I uh, support uh, Paul's uh, suggestion because uh, if uh, this policy exists uh, two years ago, I've already penalized uh, my job, uh, but uh, I want uh, to get clarification on the procedure of uh, my draft in current okay. circumstances. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jim, you're in queue. Very brief, and we, if necessary, we do have some uh, five minutes in the next session. But uh, please go ahead. No, sorry, I've just I forgot to put my hand down. Okay, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and it's up again. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for your feedback, uh, working group. Um, indeed, as Paul asked, also send some uh, uh, comments or feedback on the mailing list, and. As I understand, uh, and also the question of the author, but also from uh, Jim and uh, maybe others, uh, up to working group last call, 
in well a couple of weeks we will coordinate it with the author and the dinos hop uh, chairs is Great. that Thank fine you. with you paul absolutely absolutely and it sounds like especially since i'm blocking dimitri you know this could be a twofer <laughs> Good. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Suzanne, you have some closing remarks for, before the next session? Sure, why not? Yeah. Um, that's, that concludes our first session. Um, please don't forget to sign out of this Meet Echo session and join the other one because um, they are in separate, the sessions are in separate rooms, but we do have two hours for the next one, and that begins in exactly half an hour. So, um, Go get some refreshment, take a walk around the block, and we will see you shortly for session two. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye.